Greetings, citizens. What's up, my dudes? Welcome to my channel, and welcome to today's first ever drunk mystery episode. I am uh, so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow, in all this craziness today, you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer. And today we're going to be discussing the mysterious case of the D.B. Cooper slash Dan Cooper hijacking. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell because I put out a new video every single week, sometimes more than one. Okay. And I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. And you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you want. They're both Bratterstein, but no pressure. Now, if you've never been here before, first off, hi, welcome. Normally on this channel, every Monday, I do a series called Morbid Makeup where I tell you a true crime story while I'm doing a full face of makeup. It's a, uh, it's a fun time. It's a fun time. You know, it's morbid. <laughs> but anyway, I decided I wanted to ha add, add a new series to my channel and thus... So, how it was born, you know, shower thoughts, you know how that's where all the best thoughts come? Well, I was in there not washing my hair because I hardly ever wash my hair and I was just kind of thinking and I started thinking about the show Drunk History, which if you have not seen, highly recommend, very funny, also very educational. And I was like, hmm, that's a fun show. That's a fun idea. And I had already been toying with the idea of adding new types of content to this channel. And I've been kind of feeling out my subscribers, putting up polls, seeing what you were interested in. And I found that you are interested in more open-ended cases, more mysterious stories, this and that, this and that. And I thought that's what these videos could be for. So Drunk Mysteries is going to be me sitting down, maxing and relaxing, chilling, not killing, telling you stories about puzzling cases, maybe unsolved mysteries, maybe, or, you know, cases that are maybe like solved, but like collectively, we don't really think are solved. You feel me? Just spooky stuff, unsolved stuff, mysteries, if you will. And while I tell you these stories, I'm going to have me a little drink. Hence the drunk part in drunk mysteries. If that sounds like a good time to you, please stick around. I think you're going to like it. I think I'm going to like it. I think this is going to be a good time. So today I thought we'd start off with a bang and discuss one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in FBI history, the D.B. Cooper hijacking. Now, if you had never heard of this case before today, don't feel bad because until recently, neither had I. <laughs> I actually heard of this case from the same place I heard of the El Dorado Jane Doe case from my friend Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. I don't know if Ryan's watching this, but uh, he told me about this case and I was like, hmm, he's like, maybe you could do it on your channel. And I was like, hmm, and I was like, I don't really know how that would fit. So it's not really a murder. And we kind of talk about murder here, but now I have the perfect place to cover this case. That rhymed. That's fun. See, fun, fun times. I told you, just hang around. So recently I started looking into this case. And when I tell you, I fell into a whole bro. There is so much information and you're just like, what happened? How did this happen? Where did he go? There's a lot to it. And I can see why it's so popular, so mysterious and why so many people have researched it so much. So with all that said, let me uh, sip on this wine and tell you the story of the tall, dark and mysterious D.B. Cooper. The one that got away. <laughs> so let's jump in our handy dandy time machine and let's head to the early afternoon of November 24th, 1971, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. This is where a quiet man in his mid forties entered wearing a suit. He had like a white shirt, a black tie, some loafers, a trench coat, carrying a cheap briefcase. He walked in to the Portland, Oregon airport and he bought a one way ticket to Seattle for $20. First off, can you even imagine? Cause I really can't. That's so $20. We wipe our asses with $20 these days. It's ridiculous. Anyways, he bought the ticket from the Northwest Orient Airlines. It was for flight number 305, headed to Seattle, Washington, as I said. And this is literally only an hour long flight. Like it's gonna be a real quick trip. Just whoop, then we are there. And once he got on the plane, he settled down and he ordered a bourbon and water from the flight attendant. So he could just sit and chill and wait for the plane to take off. Mm. Cool. 
Shortly after the plane took off at about 3 p.m., the man who had identified himself as just Dan Cooper, he was like, he beckoned over the flight attendant. He's like, psst, psst, Miss Lady, Miss Lady, can you, can you come over here real quick? Just real quick. And once she approached him, he handed her a note. As she opened the note, I can only imagine that she was straight shitting her pants because the note said, hey, you know, have a seat uh, right on next to me because I have a bomb in this briefcase, so you might want to do what I say. Uh, so she did exactly what he said, and she had a seat down next to him, which I can only imagine must have been horrifying. Okay. Once she had a seat, he went ahead and opened up the briefcase, the briefcase a little bit and was like, hey, look. And she saw a mess of wires and some red sticks of dynamite, just, you know, like the way you imagine cartoon dynamite or the dynamite that uh, Jim Carrey makes in The Mask, that kind of dynamite. And she's like... Oh shit. And he was like, now do me a favor, okay? Will you please write down everything I say right now? Because I have another note that I need written that I need you to hand on over to that captain. So the message for the pilot stated that he wanted four parachutes and $200,000 all in $20 bills. Now, I don't know if he had thought, because I was thinking about it, I was like, did he think they had this on the plane? Because they definitely didn't. But anyways, another interesting fact about what he like requested for his ransom was that he had asked for this money in, and I quote here, negotiable American currency, which is not really the way I imagine an American person would ask for this money because I've never heard that term in my entire life. So the flight continued. And can you imagine how horrifying that must have been for anyone who actually knew what was going on? Like, oh my God, everybody's just on this plane. It's the day before Thanksgiving. They're just trying to get home to eat all of their candy dams, their green bean casserole, their mac and cheese. And this guy's like, just kidding. I'm gonna fucking take this plane hostage because I would love some dollars, please. So the plane lands and he makes a deal with the, you know, the hostage negotiators or whoever, whoever, whoever. And he's like, okay, I'm going to let these 36 passengers off. They're yours. And what you're going to do is you're going to give me all the dollars that I'd like, but don't worry. The, uh, the investigators made sure to know the serial numbers of all the 20s because like for science. Okay. Uh, so they get off the plane, the plane gets refueled. He gets his ransom. He gets his parachutes. He keeps the crew and they're on their way. They, they leave together again. Once the plane was back in the sky, the hijacker made sure to let the pilot know like, hey, head to Mexico City and stay at 10,000 feet or below during this flight. And with that, they were on their way. Uh, so this is where shit gets wild. If you have not heard of this case, this is the part where you're going to want to, as Ash and Elena say on the Morbid Podcast, hold on to your butts. At about 8 p.m., so about five hours after this whole thing started, somewhere between Seattle, Washington, and Reno, Nevada, this is where they were in the sky, somewhere between those two locations, homeboy puts on his little parachute, he unclips his black J.C. Penny clip-on tie, tosses a, you know, we're not going to be needing that where we're going. He puts on these little sunglasses that, are, that were like goggles, you know, he grabbed his ransom money, he bid the crew adieu. And this guy hopped out the back of the plane. 10,000 feet in the air into pure darkness. He just was like, later players, and he jumped right out. I don't think he actually gave like a little salute, but that's just how I pictured this goodbye in my head. And dude, he just like jumped out. He didn't know where he was. All he had said is like head to Mexico City. They weren't there yet. He didn't give the the like the pilot the exact route he wanted to go. He was just like, this place looks as good as any other place. And he just like whew, hopped right out and was like, bye, I'm done. Bye later. <laughs> I just, that's what? I would never. So after this, the late, <laughs> get it together. So after this, the plane landed safely. Everybody was cool. Nobody was hurt. Everybody was chilling, not killing, but, uh, the hijacker was gone into the night and thus began one of the greatest mysteries in FBI history. I'm on top of it today. When this all happened, the press went wild, as I'm sure you can imagine. This is actually, it was through the press that uh, the hijacker actually got the name D.B. Cooper. He only identified himself as Dan Cooper, but this was a mistake like in, in the press. They heard something wrong and they were like, yeah, D.B. Cooper. But no one knows what a D.B. stands for. I'm going to imagine that it stands for Dan Baby Back Bitch Cooper. That's Dan Baby Back Bitch Cooper to you. Anyways, um, the FBI got involved. They heard about the, uh, the hijacking 
while it was still in flight. And they were very interested, as I'm sure you can imagine. And they started a little task force and they called it NORJAC, which stood for North West Hijacking. Clever girls. So investigators started searching that plane nose to tail. No stone was left unturned. They wanted to try to find anything that they could to find the identity of the man who had bested them and just flown off into the night like a literal flying squirrel. A flying squirrel with a parachute that says uh, Claremont Village, California Wine Walk. That was from like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. I've been able to drink for a long time. One of the best pieces of evidence that were... That, one of the best pieces of evidence that the investigators were able to uncover was that tie that D.B. Cooper, the, the black tie that he was like, threw into the wind, it stayed in the plane. And that was one of the best pieces of evidence that they were able to uncover because it had a little microscopic piece of DNA on it that to this date has never been matched to anyone. Anyone. I wonder if they're ever going to put it into one of those like... Um, 23andMe uh, databases so that we can kind of identify him the way we identified like Gold State Killer, El Dorado Jane Doe. It would be a good idea. I wonder if anyone's thought about that yet. Excuse me, Mr. FBI man, have you thought about that? So many people were interviewed who were, uh, you know, part of the hijacking, who were there during the hijacking, or who had interacted at all with this man during the commission of this crime and of these people who were interviewed were the two flight attendants who had been on the plane and had spoken to him that day. Tina Mucklau and Lawrence Schaffner were the two flight attendants who were on the plane that day and they were interviewed by investigators. These two women were interviewed right after the hijacking took place so all of the information would be you know very fresh and clear and new in their mind and they both gave pretty detailed descriptions of him and both of the descriptions were pretty spot on to what to each other one and also the people who had uh like been at the airport when he flew down let out the passengers refueled got his ransom money those people described him the same as well so everybody had a pretty good idea of what this guy looked like and everybody's i like idea of him matched very well and from these descriptions a composite sketch was drawn db cooper dan cooper was described as being a tall-ish man like six feet ish with no accent he was described as being in his 40s, 170 to 180 pounds, with brown hair, brown eyes, and a low, intelligent sounding voice. Sounds hot, am I right? Um, individuals who are attracted to men? So initially, the charges against Coop, I'm gonna call him Coop, at this point we're kind of friends. Uh, initially, the charges against Coop were, it was air air piracy, which is something that prior to this day I had never even heard of. I did not know that was a thing, but all types of piracy are a crime, guys, just um, in case you didn't remember. But they ended up switching this because the statutes of limitations on air piracy is like pretty low, right? I think they could only be charged with that for like five years. So investigators were like, fuck, we are coming up on five years and we don't know who this guy is. So they ended up charging him with violating the Hobbs Act, which essentially says like you cannot actually or try to commit robbery or extortion is the way I understand it. If you know more about the Hobbs Act, please let it educate a girl down below because I would love to be educated by you, specifically you. Uh, but either way, apparently this doesn't have a statute of limitations. So no matter how long it took the FBI to actually find this guy, they could still get him for what he did. So during the commission of this investigation, they had hundreds of suspects. At one point, they even had 800 suspects and they narrowed that down from 800 to two dozen. Like they went through everyone. They're like, hey, did you do it? And they were like, no. And they're like, okay. Hey, did you do it? No. Okay. And they got down to only two dozen suspects. The FBI coordinated with a lot of other uh, field offices to conduct searches and they tracked evidence all across the country. But to this day, they have never found anything that could lead to the identity of the hijacker. This guy, who, who are you, DB? Dan, Vivek Bitch Cooper, who are you? You know? And of course, there have been developments, and there are theories. 
In the years since the hijacking, there have been many, many people who have written into like newspapers or the police saying that they know who Coop is or that they themselves are the infamous D.B. Cooper. There were even two dudes, Donald Murphy and William Lewis, who ended up being arrested and charged with extortion because they claimed to be D.B. Cooper and they uh, tried to sell the rights to his life story for profit. Maybe get a job. Donnie, Will, Billy Boy, maybe get a job. I gotta slow down, it's like 2 p.m. <laughs> I got things to do today. So the FBI has gotten numerous, numerous tips over the years and theories over the years, and they've looked into all of the ones that seemed relevant at all. You know, people calling in like, listen, my neighbor, all of a sudden had so many dollars and uh, I have no idea where they got all these dollars. So maybe this is Coop, maybe this is Mr. Coop. Uh, but in looking into them, none of them have panned out to be any actual successful leads, except for one. There has been one promising lead, one notable promising lead in this case. And this happened in 1980. So just under a decade after the uh, D.B. Cooper hijacking. Okay. So, there's this little boy, right? He's chilling at the beach with his family. So he's on the beach near the Columbia River, right? And he's hanging out. And this is when he starts digging in the sand as kids do. And while he's digging, he finds a like old beat up bag. And inside the bag, there's a bunch of old $20 bills, rubber bands still intact, buried beneath the sand. Okay. This was in Tina Bar, Washington, which is in uh, Southern Washington near the border of Washington and Oregon. The money in the bag totaled $5,800. And when looked into the serial numbers on this bag of twenties matched to the serial numbers of the money that Coop left with on that fateful day when he jumped out of the plane. So this was his money. This is the money that, well, not his money. This is the money that he stole. How did it get there? What is what? Okay. So where the money was found, it was found upstream, right? So there's no way to know exactly where the money entered the water. Cause apparently this stream, there's like two other streams that connect, turn into one giant stream. So it could have fallen in the water at any of these points and just floated upstream until somehow it ended up buried within the sand. And according to all the things I've read online, cause FBI.gov has a ton of information on this case. Uh, it was determined that this money was not placed there intentionally, but that it just, that the elements took it. So it was dropped at some point in the water, rolled around for 10 years and ended up buried in the sand on Tina Bar. After this money was found, of course, the beaches, the streams, all of that was like thoroughly searched. But even after all of this, nothing of any like real use was found. So even though we have this money, it literally leads to nowhere. It does not help the investigation at all. And this is actually a little bit of a controversial point for people who look into this case. Okay. So even though investigators have determined that this wasn't placed there intentionally, that it was washed in the water and eventually ended up there, there are people who do not believe that that is the case because it had been almost 10 years and this money was in relatively good shape. I'm going to put up photos for you. Uh, it's like a little beat up, but for 10 years in the water, the money's pretty put together. Like the edges are a little bit rounded. And additionally, the rubber bands were still intact. And apparently there was test run independent sources who said that the rubber bands would have snapped like it, they wouldn't have lasted that long. So there's theories that this wasn't, um, washed down the stream, uh, right around the river band. It wasn't that kind of situation. It was placed there intentionally to throw off investigators. What do you think? The daring hijack and disappearance remain an intriguing mystery that to this day has never been solved. Is that a good sentence? <laughs> As of 2016, the FBI has redirected the resources that they had allocated to the D.B. Cooper uh, hijacking to other cases that need their attention because like they put 40 straight years into this case when they finally called it. They're like, listen, we don't know. We don't, we, we just don't know. So, uh, let's stop looking. Cause, um, these people need help, but we're looking at this case. And at that point, if you think about it, if he was in his forties and it's been 40 years, this guy's like 80 years old, if he's even still alive, though, they're not like actually actively, uh, investigating this case anymore. All of the evidence, everything they have so far has been archived and is safely being held in the FBI headquarters in Washington, DC. And though they're not investigating it, they do say like, if you find anything concrete, like, money or the parachutes, 
let a sister know. Let a brother, let an FBI agent know. So if you find that, you know, please let them know. Now, the fun part for all you, for all you curious cats out there, we're going to talk about suspects. Okay. Pulling my table in with my drinks. Okay. So the main suspect in this crime, the man who is actually like, he's listed on FBI.gov. Like this is a very serious, serious main suspect is a man named Richard Lloyd McCoy. So Richard, Richie, he got on police's radar because less than five months after the D.B. Cooper hijacking, he went and got himself arrested. Now, what do you think he got himself arrested for? For hijacking a plane, bro. And the fact that he hijacked a plane wasn't the only thing that like perked up investigators uh, little ears. It's also because there were so many things about his hijacking and Coop's hijacking that matched so perfectly. So things that were similar about these two hijackings. First off, Rich, Richard, Dick, if you will. He, uh, he got on the plane and he asked for money, ransom money. He also asked for parachutes, four parachutes to be exact. The same number of parachutes that uh, good old Coop asked for. He also then took his earnings and he jumped out of the back of the plane, guys. He literally did the exact same thing. And it was the same type of plane as D.B. Cooper had robbed as well. And just like Coop, he was also very calm during the whole ordeal and had passed a note to the flight attendant the same way Coop did. And what did this note say? There was a bomb on the bus. And no, that's not me being stupid and forgetting we're talking about a plane. I'm quoting Speed. I'm referencing Speed, guys. One of the best movies of all time. Sorry, Keanu Reeves and Bullock. Anyway, maybe there's a chance that this Richard guy read all about the D.B. Cooper hijacking and got very inspired. That's possible, but what do you think? It's a lot, right? In the end, Richard Floyd McCoy, Richard Floyd McCoy ended up being eliminated as a suspect because he did not match the description that the people who had given descriptions of D.B. Cooper, he didn't look the same, right? But here's the thing. I wonder if they did like a lineup, a photo lineup, a physical lineup, because though, like if you look at his photo next to the composite sketch, it doesn't look that similar. Like it does a little bit. And sometimes those composite sketches are super whack. Have you have you seen the composite sketch of Richard Ramirez? I mean, oh my God, they're both named Richard. Did we just uncover something? We didn't. In addition to not really matching the composite sketch, he did also have like an alibi because the very next day, since it was Thanksgiving, he was at home having dinner with his family. And the only way he could have gotten back home is if he had somebody on the ground that would have met with him. They would have taken the money together. They would have driven there, but there was no real way that this guy could have had somebody on the ground because when he jumped out of the plane, he didn't know where he was. He didn't like tell the pilot which route to take. So he didn't know where he was. He just jumped out into the darkness. So it's very unlikely that there was somebody on the ground to meet him, pick him up, take him home. So he could be home with his family for Thanksgiving. So a fun fact for you that has nothing to do with D.B. Cooper, but does have to do with uh, Richard Floyd McCoy because I found it to be very interesting. Uh, so this guy, because he did hijack a plane and he did get ransom, and he did jump off into the night, he did end up getting caught, which is something that's also different from D.B. because D.B. never got caught. So this guy, he ended up getting hella prison time, obviously, because what he did was hella illegal. And he ended up getting 45 years, I believe it was, right? So he's there. And like almost immediately after getting put into prison, this fool escaped from prison. So he fashioned a fake gun out of dental paste because he had access to the prison dentist. Okay, so he has this little fake gun and he, he's, he's, he commandeers a garbage truck with his fake gun. He gets in, he slams through the prison fence and he's, he's gone. He's gone into the night like DB. He was actually on the run for three months before they found him in Virginia. And sadly, when they encountered him in Virginia, he like came home, they were waiting for him. They got into a gunfight and he was killed. So that's the Richard... Floyd McCoy story, um, the Cliff Notes version. So the next suspect that's listed um, on the FBI's website is Kenneth Christensen. Fuck, I got that right, dude. Yeah. Yeah. So Kenneth, Ken, Kenny boy, uh, he had been a paratrooper in the army. So hmm, he knew how to jump out of planes. Additionally, this fool, after getting out of the army, had ended up being hired as a flight attendant. Flight 
attendant at where? Northwest Orient. Which is the same um, airline that D.B. Cooper used in his hijacking. Okay. So now, police ended up getting wind, catching wind of old Kenny here because his brother, Lyle Christensen, had just been chilling at home, hanging out, watching TV, as we all do. And an episode of Unsolved Mysteries came on that was talking about D.B. Cooper's case. And he's watching it and he's like, oh, fuck, I think my dead brother might be D.B. Cooper. Because at this point, Kenneth Christensen had also died. He'd been dead for about 10 years when his brother saw this episode. Apparently, Kenneth was, one, left-handed, and it is believed that D.B. Cooper was left-handed. Two, he smoked, and D.B. Cooper smoked. Three, fool loved bourbon, which was the same as the drink that D.B. Cooper ordered when he got on the plane. And four, which is kind of weird, he was the type of guy who liked to clip out newspaper clippings that related to Northwest Orient. And he started doing that once he got hired there, but he stopped abruptly right before the, uh, the coop hijacking, and though he worked there for years after the hijacking, he never clipped a single another newspaper clipping, which is just like a little bit of an interesting fact. So at the time that the hijacking happened, he was 45 years old, but that was pretty much the only thing that was like spot on for, for DB. Because apparently he was like thinner and he was lighter and he was paler than Coop was described by the eyewitnesses. But with that said, a photo of Kenneth was shown to one of the flight attendants who had been on the plane when it was hijacked. And she said that out of all the uh, suspects she had been shown, he looked the most like Coop, okay? But she couldn't say for sure that it was him. And the FBI said that there was an absence of direct incriminating evidence. So he was excluded. So the next um, suspect that was listed on the website is a man named Dwayne Weber. Now, Dwayne Weber was a World War II veteran who had a history of being in and, out in, in and out of prison. So on Dwayne's deathbed in 1995, he had been talking to his wife and he stopped and he looked at her and he's like, I am Dan Cooper, okay? And at the time, you know, that uh, name meant nothing to her. So she was like, of, of course you are my dear, right? So then she's like at home. She's chilling. She's talking to her friends. She tells her friends what her husband said. And her friend was like, do you not know who Dan Cooper is? So after this, she, uh, she did some research and looking into the research that she had in looking into the research. What the fuck is that sentence? She was like, Oh shit. And she actually called the cops. So she told police that like, after looking into it, it was all kind of making sense to her that her husband had told her that he had an old knee injury because he had jumped out of a plane. But at the time she was like, well, yeah, bro, like he was in war World War II. Of course he had jumped out of a plane. That's no big deal. But then she started thinking like, we've been to, to Tina Bar where that money was found. So it's all just coming together in my mind, in my mind, in her mind. So investigators did find him to be an interesting suspect, but he ended up being ruled out by DNA evidence from the DNA that was on Coop's tie that he left on the plane. It wasn't a match, so apparently this guy's not the guy. He's not the guy. So there are a bunch of other suspects, but if I was to sit here and list every single suspect in the D.B. Cooper case, I could have an entire channel dedicated to Mr. Coop. Oh my God, do you guys see him? But anyways, these are the three that are listed on the FBI's website. So these are the three that we're discussing today. Also, please meet Dutters. I don't think any of you have met Dutters before. Um, he's never in the background of the videos because he only sleeps in my bed, but he decided he wanted to come out, come out here, come out here and breathe all over me with his rancid breath. So in addition to all of the suspects, there's also the, uh, the theory. Oh my God, that's so cute. There's also the theory that D.B. Cooper died on impact after jumping out of the plane. So all this time, the FBI has just been looking for a ghost. So there is evidence and theories or theories to support um, the fact that D.B. Cooper died in during in the commission of this crime. So there's a, a lot of people and I believe the FBI agrees that they don't believe that D.B. Cooper was an experienced parachuter in general, because, okay, so he was given four parachutes, right? Well, apparently one of the four parachutes they give, gave him was like 
sewn closed and would therefore not, not be functional at all. And that's one of the ones he took with him when he jumped out of the plane. And like an experienced parachute person, professional parachute person, <laughs> would have known that this was not going to be a useful parachute for him. And the parachute he did take with him was, it was like a military parachute, I believe I read, but it wasn't controllable, so he couldn't steer it. Okay, so one doesn't work, one he can't steer. So why would a professional make these choices? And if he wasn't a professional, how could he have survived this jump? It was dark, it was raining, he didn't know where he was. The pilot had chosen the uh, the route, so he just jumped into like the complete unknown. And plus, like, Fool was not dressed for jumping out of an airplane. He was wearing a suit and a, and a trench coat and loafers and all of that left with him. All he left on the plane was a tie. So he wore all of that stuff and just jumped out. And that's not really stuff you would wear when jumping out of a plane. So FBI special agent, Larry Carr, who I believe is the last agent who was on the case before it was kind of halted. He has his own theory. Well, well, his own specific theory that kind of branches off what we've talked about here. Carr thinks it's really unlikely that Coop uh, survived the jump from the plane. And he says of this, and I quote, diving into the wilderness without a plan, without the right equipment in such terrible conditions, he probably never even got his chute open. But he also says, and I quote, he came from somewhere and from someone. And that is what we want to know. So here's his thoughts on this. He thinks that DB was in the military, I believe he said the Air Force specifically, and that he had been stationed in Europe. And while in Europe, he became obsessed with the Dan Cooper comic books. So apparently these are French comic books where there's a man named Dan Cooper who does things, and a lot of the storylines are very similar to what happened with uh, DB. And apparently these comic books were never translated into English. They're French. So... Uh, Carr thinks that he'd only have exposure to them if he was overseas in Europe, because where else would he reasonably have been exposed to these French comic books? Carr also thinks that DB worked as a cargo loader on airplanes. And because of this, he would have some um, knowledge of the aviation industry. And because he was throwing cargo onto planes, he would have been um, used to wearing a parachute. He'd be wearing a parachute in case he was to fall out while loading, loading the cargo. And that would give him some knowledge on how parachutes work, the functions, but not the knowledge on how to actually use them practically in a situation where you're jumping out of a plane. He thinks that Coop may have came from the East Coast and had settled in Seattle once he was out of the mil <laughs> Once he left the military, he would have settled in Seattle. He also thinks it's possible that uh, Coop lost his job during the um, economic downturn in the aviation industry in the 1970s, the 1970, from 1970, oh my God, from 1970 to 1971. And he thinks that he was a loner who didn't have a family, so nobody would have missed him after he was gone. Do you see how much this cat is drooling? That's Carr's thoughts and that's all good and well, I guess, maybe, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think, what do you think? He's the expert. I'm just sitting here drinking some wine and talking about what everybody else has to say. But here's the thing. Here's what I actually do think, though I am just like a person who's sitting here talking about what everybody else says. Coop's body and his parachutes have never been found. Which I mean, okay, there are a lot of people who have died in life and have never been found. There are bodies everywhere. The entire planet is one giant graveyard, right? There's plenty of undiscovered bodies. So I kind of go back and forth because on one hand, like he was never discovered. But on the other hand, that kid did find that money on that beach, which leads me to believe that maybe he didn't make it. I, I mean, I guess he could have just like dropped it while he's falling. But I don't know. I go back and forth a little bit. What do you think? Is he alive? Is he dead? Is he dead? So where the FBI has stopped allocating resources to this case, they have given special permission and special um, access to a group of individuals who have been looking into this case. And they have a website called citizensleuths.com. Now, citizen sleuths, let's talk about them a little bit. Their main objective, this group of people, is to analyze the D.B. Cooper case and hopefully solve it. And they're not a federally funded organization. They're just doing it with their own money out of the kindness of their heart or just for, like, the satisfaction of solving a mystery. They're just like the Scooby-Doo gang. What are those? Mystery machine. That's the, the, that's the bus, isn't it? scrappy dappy doo They're a group of citizen scientists who just want to solve one of the most notorious mysteries of all time. This is the only hijacking case in uh, American history, I believe, that's never been solved. So they just want the satisfaction of being the ones to solve it. 
They have a theory that Coop was actually a Canadian citizen, a Canadian suspect who would have had some military experience that involved airplanes. They also think he would have worked at some sort of metalworking factory based on some of the um, metallic specs that were found on his tie and analyzed. But they also believe that he would have been like a manager or an executive, somebody in a higher up position because he was wearing a tie. So he wouldn't really be doing that heavy lifting. He would have been a well-dressed businessman, often wearing his suits because he was comfortable enough to wear his suit while committing this crime. And, but he also would have been like an avid outdoorsman and he would have particularly known the woods pretty well. In conclusion, ladies, gentlemen, my non-binary friends, was uh, D.B. Cooper a incredibly intelligent, incredibly cunning man who committed the perfect crime or was he a dingus who jumped out of a plane into the night and plummeted to the earth, exploding like a graboid? Who's to say? Some of the things he did were very smart. Like when he wrote his little notes and he would give them to the, to the flight attendant, he would ask for all of them back to, to not leave evidence. But he also smoked cigarettes on the plane and left all his cigarette butts on the plane, which were collected and lost, by the way. And he also left his tie, which contained DNA. So that's not incredibly smart, is it? The type of parachutes that he chose could be seen as dumb because you couldn't steer it, but apparently these types of military chutes are also really good for withstanding the type of weather that Coop jumped out into. So was this a coincidence or was it planned? All these questions are why to this day, Dan, baby back bitch Cooper and his hijacking is such a mystery to all who have heard it. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope you guys liked it. Did you like it? Did you have fun? Do you like the new series? Please let me know. I had a really good time. I'm having some fun. We're hanging out with daughters. I'm drinking some wine. It's pretty early and I'm a little tipsy. I got to be honest with you. I got to slow it down. And man, Danny boy, what happened to him, man? I kind of think he's dead. I kind of think he didn't make it. I feel like somebody would have known. But also, if that's the case, where is the body? Show me the body, man. It's wild. Anyways, guys, I really had fun today. I hope you did too. Um, and plus I'm like a little day drunk, which is always like a really good time because the sun is bright in the sky. And after this, I'm going to go walk my dog and be just completely shocked that like sunlight and other people exist. And that's always been a good time to me. It's like walking out of a movie theater. When you see a, uh, a matinee, you're blown away that the world still exists. But of course, let me know what you think. Cause like I have ideas in my head and I have a schedule in my head that I'm thinking of doing, but it's still pretty open. I'm kind of like feeling you guys out. So I want to know if you like it because what I do with this and if I continue with this completely depends on if you are receptive and enjoying yourself. So please sound off down below. Anyways, if you haven't joined the Brat Pack yet, please make sure to do so by subscribing and ringing the bell because I put out new videos every single week. And of course, let me know of any mysteries you would like to see me cover down below because I'm, uh, I need some new unsolved mysteries and some creepy stuff, just something that could fit into this format seamlessly. Also, if you're interested, you can look in the description box and you can find all of my social media handles so that we can hang out more consistently because I think that sounds like a great time. I don't know about you, but I'd love to hang out and chat and stuff, okay? Make sure to tune in Monday because every Monday I put out a new morbid makeup true crime video and it is a good time. I don't know if that's the right phrasing because like we are talking murder, but I think you will enjoy it if you like true crime. Uh, I have a pretty positive response to those videos, so make sure to subscribe so you can tune in. But anyways, guys, thank you for hanging out. This has been tight. You are tight. Stay creepy and stay curious, and I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.